Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. Today, my guest is none other than Josh Ellis, Editor-in-Chief of Success Magazine. Success is the only national newsstand publication dedicated to the personal development of entrepreneurs. And I have to say, I've been a subscriber for a number of years great stuff. Josh, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me, Laura. And before we get into all the business talk, um, how do you unplug when you want to think about nothing related to work and, and other elements of the world? What do you do? Uh, well, I, I like to cook and listen to podcasts. So that's usually a nice 30 to 45 minutes where I can plug in something, you know, sports related or comedy or something like that and or influence yeah. related hint hint for our next yeah yeah yeah, yeah. of course the and, next the well, next favorite and um and and i like to cook uh so at the same time and that that disconnects me from all of the troubles and what is your uh, signature dish uh, i'm a burger guy yeah. nice yeah. out on the grill uh can do them either way a nice uh, cast iron skillet get a nice char on there what everybody really is looking for. That sounds great. I'll be over Saturday, family in tow. Sounds great. (laughs) BYOB. BYOB. I can do that. I can definitely do that. What goes with a burger? Uh, Nice IPA. Got it. Got it. I am a uh, more the the Belgian, the the, the Belgian double is usually one of my favorites. So we'll we'll split. You can have the IPAs. Hops are a little much for me, but uh, all that sounds great. Okay. Now, as far as influence is concerned on the non-beer and non-burger front, in your work as editor-in-chief, who do you need to influence? Well, ultimately our readers, but uh, on a direct level, the people that I'm working with are, are writers, um, freelancers spread around the country, um, and then also our design staff in the, hmm. in the office, whenever we're in the office, um, just to get the, the, the look and feel of each, of each layout, each story layout in each issue, um, really on par with, uh, what, um, we're going for a print magazine, um, is very different from, um, you know, blogs or, or just online content because it's, it's a, it's a physical, um, product. And so people need to, it needs to evoke uh, kind of a feeling as they're flipping through it and reading it uh, rather than just a click. It's, um, you know, it's a little bit more design oriented. I think people tend to forget that now that everything is so, so, so digital all the time, like there is still a paper world out there and it needs to be done right. Yeah. <laughs> That's the constant challenge, right? We're sure. uh, Success Magazine has been around for 123 years. We were founded in 1897. Um, And it's, it's really been an enduring, of course, it's had a lot of different iterations and a lot of different ownership groups and things like that. Um, But the kind of founding principles, as you said in the beginning, personal development for entrepreneurs, for achievers, uh, really has been the basis of it all along. And we serve um, you know, leaders just just like yourself. Then, in that world, what's the biggest communication challenge that you and/or the magazine are facing today? You know, it's despite how old we are, um, <laughs> which is impressive, it, by the way. Yeah, the it's not uh, you know it's 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 not um, a brand that is necessarily um, self-explanatory because success. Mm is such a relative term. It means so many different things to so many different people. And you know, societal views on what success is tend to change through mm. over the years and over the generations. And so um, you know, it's, it's really getting um, new writers and the talent that we work with to understand and have a vision, have share our vision of what the brand is and how we should serve the reader. So you know, as I said, it's, it's personal development for entrepreneurs, for achievers, uh, for leaders, but that isn't necessarily entirely um, limited to work and um, business. So I, I tend to tell people that we're sort of a mix between Inc. or entrepreneur who we're next to on the newsstand, a mix between those and, oh, the Oprah magazine, right? Because we're, <laughs> we're trying to, um, you know, help our, our readers create better lives that, that they're more proud of. And, and um, 
live with happiness and health and growth and purpose. And so it's a really a, a lot more holistic view of, of success than just, um, you know, business or, or monetary. Right. I remember that for me, I was always, it was surprising to me when I realized originally that that was the focus of the magazine because there's so much Tony Robbins and I mean, sure there's the John Maxwell, uh, more business oriented leadership kind of input that you've got, but also more the personal Tony Robbins, how to be your best you, which is not necessarily business oriented. So uh, I, I did think it was really great that it addressed the whole person that way. Yeah. I, I've, I've just always felt that, um, you know, if you made a lot of money, but you weren't really happy or if you, or if you uh, made a lot of money, but you know, it, it, you, you uh, couldn't, um, you know, you couldn't, play with your kids because you were winded, um, then, then are you really, are you really reaching what you would probably view as your own definition of success? Um, it's, it's just, um, like I said, we keep going back to those tent poles of happiness, health, uh, and then growth and purpose, um, alongside obviously the, the business goals that so many of our readers have. Right, right. Money is definitely not the end all be all. It helps. Let's not get, you know, let's... of course, sure. of course. It, it is much more the means than the end. Then for you personally, what specific communication skills did you have to develop in order to get to the top? It was really about overcoming imposter syndrome uh, mm. and feeling like I belonged in my role. I was, uh, you know, I had been at Success, I'd been as the features editor for uh, several years, and I really always looked up to the position of editor in chief but to become the editor in chief, I would have been one of the youngest uh, people in that position at any magazine in the country uh, when I took over. And so I, as much as any um, interviewing that I had to do or planning, um, I had to convince myself that, um, that I was ready for it. And, um, you know, as I, even once I took over um, that, um, imposter syndrome still kind of stuck with me a little bit because I'd never managed a team before. And I, you know, I found myself in a position which um, I think um, at some point we mentioned John Maxwell, who's been our columnist for a long time. And he talks about the positional leader, someone who is just, um, you know, they're, they get things out of their people because they on the organizational chart, you know, the flow chart they report to them. And I wanted to be more than that because I think that, um, you know, when your people uh, really believe in you and the mission, then they're going to go above and beyond uh, much more. And so um, I had to get over that imposter syndrome. A lot of times, you know, I had a vision for the magazine where we were going to, instead of writing about Tony Robbins, we were, go I was going to ask our writers to do the things that they, you know, that would make them more of an expert on personal development would make, you know, they reach the goal. And so I challenged our junior editors to, you know, one of them to take up stand up comedy to overcome that uh, a fear of public speaking by taking up stand up comedy. Another one, uh, we had a, a, another guy who, um, you know, went on one of the country's most treacherous hikes uh, wow. through, the, through the mountains in North Carolina. So I was pushing my people to, to do these scary things. Um, and I, as the, as their leader, as the editor in chief, I wasn't necessarily doing it myself yet. Mm. Uh, and I wanted to create the bunker mentality and get down there in the dirt with them. And so, uh, I took on a story myself where I, um, I signed up for an amateur boxing event. And oh my gosh. I, I trained for almost a year, uh, prep preparing to, to, uh, to box, um, this other, <laughs> this other guy. And he turned out to be like a, uh, it was set up through one of the local, uh, sports radio stations. They have a fight night every year. And, um, you know, this guy turned out to be like ex military and thank God I did the training and I survived it. Um, <laughs> but You're here to tell the story, I am here to tell the story. And the thing is my team, uh, when they saw me going through that, they saw me take a punch for them for the sake of a story in the magazine. Um, and do the same things that I was asking them to do. Um, I think it was a lot easier to uh, to push them to be their best and go the extra mile after that. 
And can you just uh, go back for a half a second? Because I think there are, I think everybody understands the, the concept of imposter syndrome internally, but not everybody is familiar with the term. And I'm so glad you brought it up because this is something that a lot of clients will struggle with that we work through. But I find that it's in mostly more often in women's organizations that the concept is named per se. Guys don't tend to name it as much, although men and women leaders struggle with it equally. How would you define imposter syndrome? No, I, I think it's outwardly you reflect all of the um, all of the signs of of leadership, um, all the you know the deserving aspects that we look for in leaders, all the reasons for respect. But inwardly, you just kind of question um, whether that's all there and how people um, how people are perceiving you. Um, so there's probably a lot more of a clinical definition of it. I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about it for me. It was, it was that, um, as I said, I was one of the, the youngest chief editors in the country and half of my team was older than me. And so I, I just sort of, um, at first felt, um, that they, they were not, um, going to see me as the. Um, as the leader that I wanted to be. And I had to, um, you know, I had to take those steps to, to overcome that imposter syndrome. I think a, a common definition is the, the fear of being exposed as a fraud. That somebody's going to look at you and go, you don't belong here. You're not yeah. ready for this. You don't deserve this. Whether or not they think they do is, is not necessarily the point, but that, that fear that somebody's going to expose you. And as long as somebody says it, you're okay. But that, that feeling of uncertainty inside. And I think almost everybody deals with it. Uh, and in fact, if you don't deal with it, then, then, you know, there may be something a little bit wrong with you. Yeah. Uh, if, Maybe you're if, just not pushing yourself hard enough. If, if the first time that, that you found yourself in a position of power, you didn't kind of question whether you deserved it, then, um, there, that might be like a little sociopathic tendency. There. <laughs> That's way above my pay grade. That my PhD is in a totally other world, so I'm going to leave that one alone. But uh, the so I'm really glad you brought that up because it is something that many people struggle with, and uh, the communication skills uh, to be that kind of leader are ultimately something that will help people to be seen in the eyes of the people who now are under them in the org chart, so to speak, or below them level wise, to uh, to be able to reach that connection and allow them to truly be seen as the leader not just in name only or in position only. So thank you so much for sharing that and, and allowing us to discuss that really important concept. Then what's one big communication related mistake that you've made along the way or a lesson you've had to learn the hard way? You know, I, I think a lot of times it's assuming that the writer understands an assignment beforehand mm. um, and assume, assuming that they get that, that vision, you know, in in a lot of ways, um, I, I've, I've come to, uh, almost ask them to repeat it back to me before, um, trusting that they get it. You know, I, I, when, when something comes out of our, um, our brains and our mouths, it makes sense to us typically, but you know, as, as someone who has studied uh, communication, you know, that people don't catch every word. So yes. no matter how precisely you chose, uh, this adjective over that one, they might not have even heard it at all because they, you know, they have something going on in their own head or, um, or they were looking at your shirt or whatever it might have been. So um, it's, it's making sure that um, the people who are going to be communicating on behalf of our brand understand what, what and why they're saying what they're saying. Um, and so in editing the, the common you know, the phrase is that an ounce of preparation or, or uh, prevention is better than a pound of cure. Sure. So, uh, so that's, that's, that's uh, a mistake that I've made and have, am constantly, um, constantly working on doing better at. Yeah. A lot of the majority of what I do is all about helping people close the gap between quote unquote, what I think I say and what you think you hear. Exactly. Why is there that gap? And we, we realize that a lot of it, as you mentioned, is based on assumptions uh, that, that create that interpretation difference. So we know where you're coming from. What's next? What's the next big goal either for you personally or for success? And what skills would you need to develop in order to achieve it? You know, as we were saying right off the top, it's 
it's getting people to understand that there are still print magazines and it's still worth it to take that time. A lot of times it's for yourself. It's a, it's a, a pleasure read. Um, it's, it's, you know, something that you would take a couple, three hours to do on the weekend um, to sit down and not, not just um, to, to make your reading time something that you do in the margins while you're waiting in the doctor's office mm. or on your commute or something while you scroll through your phone, but something that is, is worth doing for you. Uh, and so it's creating that value proposition. That's a, that's a marketing question as much as anything, but you know, editorially it's how do we give them something in print that they can't get on success.com, which is you know available for free. They're having to pay for the print magazine or on our social channels or anywhere else from any other print magazine or any other media outlet. It's just, um, explaining that value proposition of, of the brand and the product. Now this then brings us, there's one challenge, right? Finding the time to, to read for yourself. What's your challenge now that you would like to offer our, our, our listeners? It's time for the listener 24 hour influence challenge, something that people can complete one step they can take in 24 hours in order to have more influence. All right, you have to find and demonstrate an action, one action uh, as the leader of your team that proves that you are a leader by example, uh, not a positional leader, somebody who's just giving orders because you are um, on a higher level in an organizational structure, but that you are in the bunker with your people, you get down and dirty with them and uh, show that you're one of them. And even if you're somebody who's not necessarily in a leadership role, quote unquote, you can still lead by example. In what way are you going to take the lead? Are you going to demonstrate something and, and model what you believe others can do? So whether or not you have that role, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to extend that a little bit here because we've got a lot of different people listening in. How do you lead by example? Does that sound good? I love it. Perfect. Then this brings us to part two, guiding others on the journey. We've talked a little bit about you and your work. Now let's talk about how you work with others, how you lead your team, succession planning, career advancement, et cetera, within success. When you think about terms like executive presence or otherwise known as leadership presence, command presence, what does it mean to you? Well, it's not something that I tend to think about a lot, honestly, mm -hmm. um, but it's probably, it's probably there subconsciously. I, I sure. am aware of that. Um, you know, we meet our customers through the printed page. Um, and so the people, the writers that, that I work with, I need to know that they can do the creative work well. And I don't really think about, uh, somebody's posture or how well they can speak in the setting of a presentation. I mean, one of our best writers has a stutter and, um, but it doesn't matter because I'm, I'm worried about the, the work that he can do, um, in the written form of the written word. Um, but if, if a person, if I'm interviewing someone for a job or, or trying, conversation about uh, possibly becoming a freelancer for us, then if the person is serious uh, and they can rise to the challenge of, of, of interviewing a, a celebrity or a billionaire entrepreneur uh, without being intimidated, um, then they're usually not going to be uh, over their head in a conversation with me, right? They, they, um, I, they need to be able to handle themselves just in a conversational sense with me so that I can trust that they can do it with somebody who's way more intimidating and way more, uh, has way more executive presence even than me. So, um, and likewise, um, since we're doing things in a written, in the written format all the time, I need their emails, their pitches to be well organized and well written and thoughtful, um, so that I can trust that what they're going to be writing about in our magazine is, is going to, uh, is going to be the exact same. Sure. Then it'll reflect your brand, even though it's in an email, doesn't mean it doesn't count. And especially, you know, in, in this day and age where so many of us are working remotely and, and, um, you know, we're not face to face, then I, I think that there is something to be said about a pro professional email written correspondence. Um, almost it's as important as, as letters actually used to be maybe 123 years ago when the magazine started. <laughs> yes, certainly when, uh, e even today, the, the art of the written words on paper in particular is, is respected when it's done, even though it's not done all that much anymore. But when I know when I get a handwritten note or something actually in the physical mail, that's a personal note, it always touches me as well. Mm -hmm. 
So when you think about succession planning, grooming a high potential employee or looking to hire somebody for a leadership role, what are the three most important communication skills you look for, aside from, of course, their technical writing chops? Okay. Well, first, I need to know, I, I, I'm looking to see if they ask good questions um, because in, in an interview setting, um, you know, they're, they're going to be forced to, to ask questions of people. And, and so I want to know their level of curiosity and engagement. That usually um, means that they can hold their own in the interviews uh, with the you know, influencers that uh, we write about. Um, do they listen well? Um, and that's going to make the first part of asking questions easier, obviously. Uh, and then just their level of comfort. Like I was, I was saying before, it, you know, if, if somebody is uneasy um, in a job interview, then um, they're, they're going to be even more uneasy when they're talking to Mark Cuban. Um, so it, just their level of comfort. Right. And those are some big names. I can imagine that would be rather intimidating to talk to. You know, when I started in, um, as, as a professional journalist, I was a sports writer and I, I was covering the Dallas Cowboys. And I, I just remember, you know, passing in the hallway one day, Drew Bledsoe, who was kind mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, had like an average to decent NFL quarterback career. But I was 22 and this was Drew Bledsoe. <laughs> and like, so like my heart kind of like pounded a little bit. Um, you know, that's been, you know, a decade plus and, and we're, we've, I'm a big boy now. And so I can handle um, a, you know, a lot more important people. Um, but our, our writers and the people who are, are working on behalf of success, uh, they need to be past that as well. But I understand it when you're starting out. Sure. And there's always somebody else that you look up to. There's always somebody who's, who's the brass ring who you think to yourself, boy, if I could talk to that person, that would be amazing. And then, you know, the heart starts going a little pitter patter when you do finally have that opportunity. Yeah, it does happen. <laughs> now, on the flip side, what's a red flag? What's a red flag that could be a career derailer or otherwise stop you from hiring or promoting somebody? You know, there's probably a bunch of them. Um, but just generally, I think it's an inability to act independently um, and take ownership of their projects. You know, if somebody needs to form like a little committee to discuss every minute decision, um, and you know, we're talking about communication. And so, um, you have to understand when you have the freedom to make decisions for your own without engaging in communication, that's going to disrupt other people. Um, you know, I think that the best organizations empower their people to make decisions and take actions. Um, and if they aren't grasping that opportunity, uh, then they're probably not prepared to be leaders themselves. There's no such thing as a bad question, but there are such things as, as bad meetings. And uh, mm. from a communications uh, standpoint, um, so some of the, that could be avoided from time to time. So, yeah. I don't think there's a person out there who would disagree with the notion that there is such a thing as bad meetings. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. There, less and less, though, in, in this new remote work paradigm. I'm, 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 I'm liking it. Well, and I think that the definition of what's a good meeting versus a bad meeting changes a lot when you go from being in person in the office together all day to being here in the virtual realm, just what it takes to be effective, to project authority, what it takes to be time efficient and, and get results from a virtual meeting, even when it's when people are tempted to multitask uh, as much as they are can, can be a challenge as well. Exactly. Now, what about the concept of managing up. I like to refer to this as my pet peeve question. When your direct, or for that matter, indirect reports have to present information up to you, what's something you just wish they'd do differently? So I guess my answer to this is the flip side of my answer to the last question, okay. which would be, if you have a dilemma, um, don't, we don't need to have the meeting. We don't need to necessarily um, confer on every single question but be prepared to make a recommendation. Like I'm not the kind of leader who thinks that I know it all. Um, humility is especially important for anybody in a leadership position. Um, and knowing that even though I have more of a 30,000 foot view than um, our writers or our designers or someone who ultimately reports to me, um, I, that 30,000 foot view doesn't necessarily see the full picture because I can't see it through their vantage point. So I want to know, their vantage point and what their recommendation is 
Um, I may have reason ultimately to, to make a different decision, go a different way, but I want to be able to consider their reasons as well uh, because they may not be the same as mine. Yes. Well, Josh, just, excuse me. Ooh. This brings us to our speed round. And the speed round is where we're going to look at three topics that are the most commonly uh, the, the most commonly raised issues, concerns, frustrations that people tend to bring up in my coaching and training sessions. And part of the problem is that people tend to think of them as black and white, either or issues, and really they're not. So we want to let them know that they're not the only ones who struggle with these issues, and we want to help them understand a little bit more perspective on it. So with each one, I'm going to ask you in to give a single word or phrase about where you fall on this, on these dichotomies or these continua, I should say. And then I'll prompt you up for a little bit more insight, a little more advice with regard to each one as well. Sound good? That works. All right. So first, public speaking, love it or hate it? Love it. Okay. Then give us one tip for managing nerves or speaking with confidence, maybe even for someone who doesn't feel it. It's got to be preparation. Um, we've in, in, um, through success, we've studied John Wooden a lot, the legendary UCLA basketball coach. He won like 10 national championships and he, he actually was a student of, of personal development and he built, um, uh, what he called the pyramid of success. And it had all of these, um, building blocks that allowed his teams to become champions. And one of them, one of the cornerstones of it was preparation. And he would say, know and know that, you know, um, mm. so that, that eliminates a lot of the nerves and the doubt. If you know that, you know, um, there's nothing that can trip you up because you're going to, um, you know, be able to recover because you know, the subject matter that well, um, that you could do it in your sleep. Um, or, you know, for me, I also like to have a teleprompter in place <laughs> just to, just in case. Sure. And look, there's nothing wrong with that to be it. It's it that helps you to know your material, especially if it's not something that you have a ton of time to prepare and you want to make sure that you don't forget what you want to say. If it is something that you're doing remotely and uh, it is not something that's intended to be interactive from start to finish, that's a great tool to use. There's a lot of good apps out there, a lot of good materials. So why not? Yeah. I, I when I was first starting out uh, with public speaking, I, I couldn't have done it without it. Sure. Okay, then next, introvert or extrovert? Where do you fall? Uh, introvert. Okay, and as an introvert, what's one related strength and one related area for growth? I think the strength is listening. Introverts um, typically don't want to or don't feel the need to um, overly talk about themselves, and so we're better prepared to ask questions to get someone, the other person talking. Um, and then the related area for growth, um, I would say is networking. Uh, I don't usually love those sorts of environments, the mixer, um, the, that sort of thing. Um, so, um, introverts just are not overly interested in small talk. I'd like to have, uh, deeper conversations with a few people rather than more shallow ones with a lot of people. Um, so that's, it's still an area for growth though, is getting uh, more comfortable, uh, in that setting. Finally, what about conflict? When faced with the potential uh, for, of needing to deal with a conflict or even a difficult conversation, is your natural instinct, the way you're genetically hardwired, to want to avoid it or to want to address it head on? Address it head on. And what have you learned about that tendency and what's some advice that you can give others whose reflexes like yours? Um, I, I've learned that people respect it if you are candid and as long as you, um, offer that candor out of respectfulness and a, you know, really genuine desire to, uh, rectify the conflict, fix things, uh, whatever difference you may, might have with them. And also without judgment of them and their position, then they're going to be a lot more willing to work with you. So just uh, coming sort of open-handed uh, with, uh, you know, a willing, willing mind and heart, um, they're, they're, you know, more prepared if you want to address things head on. Terrific. Josh, 
How can people learn more about you and Success Magazine? Well, as always, go to success.com and you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I would also invite everybody, of course, just as you have, Laura, to subscribe. You can go to success.com slash subscribe and uh, get the magazine. Definitely a worthwhile and easy personal investment. Josh, thank you so much for joining me today. Enjoyed it. And thank you everybody else for tuning in. I want to remind you all, if you haven't done so yet, please subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Give us a five-star rating on iTunes so we can help even more people increase their confidence, presence, and influence. And finally, of course, if you'd like to download my quick start guide to mastering the three C's, command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thanks for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.